Welcome everybody, welcome ladies and gentlemen to our 17th HHL Expo talk tonight. First of all, I'm very delighted to see many people tuning in today and I hope you've all been safe and sound during this uh, rather difficult and turbulent times. For everybody who's tuning in for the very first uh, time today, I'd like to briefly explain uh, what the HHL Expo talk actually is and why we're doing this. It is a virtual talk series with which we, HHL, aim to address latest key topics in research to broaden our knowledge transfer on current social, economic, and political topics. And all our talks are led by experts, HHL experts. To briefly introduce myself, my name is Sigrid Fischer, and I'm the director of Korean alumni relations here at HHL. Previously, I studied journalism and psychology at Indiana University in the US and continued with a master's of science in performance psychology at the University of Edinburgh, where I also had a chance to work later on in my career. At HHL, um, it's one of my key interests to enhance lifelong guidance for our HHL community. And for me, it's hugely important um, to embrace networking. And as part of that, I've been moderating our expert talk series since April, 2020. Before I'm introducing our expert for tonight, um, I would like to give you a few facts and figures of HHL. HHL was established more than 120 years ago in Leipzig here in Germany. It is our mission to educate entrepreneurial, responsible and effective business leaders through outstanding teaching, research and practice. We're driven by excellence to benefit our students, stakeholders and society. So where exactly are we today? Today, we have more than 700 students within our five programs. And these five programs are our full-time and part-time Masters of Science, our full-time and part-time MBA, as well as our PhD program. We're proud to have more than 60 nations represented within our student body and to have an active alumni community of more than 3,300 alumni. As entrepreneurial minded university, we're particularly proud that more than 300 startups uh, which created already more than 40,000 jobs were founded or co-founded by HHL alumni. We're also happy to have strong bonds to more than 130 partner universities around the globe. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to our expert for tonight, and that is Professor Dr. Calvin Willoughby. Professor Willoughby is Professor in the Stiftungsfonds Deutsche Bank Chair of Innovation Management and Entrepreneurship at HHL Leipzig Graduate School of Management. He is an expert on the management of intellectual property, technology-based entrepreneurship, and strategic planning for technology-based industry development. He holds doctorates in both strategic management and technology studies, and a master's degree in intellectual property law. In addition to his experience with startups, Professor Willoughby has extensive experience as a university professor, researcher, and industry consultant in the United States, in Europe, Asia, Australia, and Russia. And he has directed internationally prominent graduate programs in both business administration and the management of technology innovation. He's also active as both an academic and as well as as a trainer and advisor to industry and government. It is my pleasure to hand over to Professor Willoughby now. For everybody in the audience, we will have a Q&A um, subsequently to Calvin's talk. And please type in all the questions you maybe have into the chat and we will go through them in due course. So I'm handing over the virtual microphone and the stage is all yours. Please everybody enjoy it tonight. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm delighted to talk with you. I joined uh, HHL just midway through last year and I'm really delighted to be here. Wonderful group of students, wonderful colleagues, wonderful environment in this amazing city, Leipzig. I'm gonna to talk today about entrepreneurship, particularly technological entrepreneurship uh, in the local context, well, let me, Put this on full screen hang on yeah that's better and uh the way that entrepreneurship fits into a global environment and in particular the role of intellectual property most of my career has been studying uh, technology ventures technology entrepreneurial activity in particular and in the last 10 or 15 years i've concentrated my attention on the role that intellectual property plays in the growth and success or otherwise of uh, entrepreneurial technology ventures. And I'm gonna talk about that today. But let me begin with a story, uh, a very European story. You recognize this guy? Probably, astronomer, it's, it's Galileo, Galileo Galilei, a father of modern astronomy. And many say the father or pioneer of uh, modern science in Europe. Now, interestingly, 
he was doing his work at the same time as Goethe was here in Leipzig. And in fact, I live in a street down the road from where Goethe used to meet when he wrote Dr. Faustus. Interesting coincidence. So Galileo and uh, Goethe, my two ins inspirational friends here in Leipzig. Um, what's gone wrong here with the screen? Excuse me a moment. Okay, Galileo is famous for inventing this telescope. And here's a, a photograph of his actual telescope. What's important to recognize is that even though he's widely recognized as the founder or pioneer of modern European science, he was actually a technologist, a very practical guy. And before he became a scientist, he was very active in making lenses. And in fact, his great astronomical dis uh, discoveries came after his early work in developing the tools of astronomy, the uh, telescope in particular. So Galileo was a craftsman, skilled in all kinds of tools. For example, a lathe, a lathe which he used to grind lenses for his famous uh, telescope. But let me say more about that. He was also uh, an accomplished inventor. He was active in civil engineering, in flood control and pumping in his city. He developed thermometers, scales, compasses, clock. So he was very, uh, shall we say, versatile and, and competent as a practical inventor in technology. So in fact, he was an entrepreneur, a technological entrepreneur. He did a lot of practical business where he lived in Italy. And he drew, in fact, upon technology embedded in information from the foreign patent system, Netherlands in particular, and he tried also to make use of the, the local patent system for his own business in, in Italy. And he subsequently became a scientist. And the reason I'm telling you this story is that uh, Galileo represents a very important theme of technological innovation. We sometimes think that technology is derived from science, but in fact, if you look historically, you find that practical technologists messing around, trial and error, trying to solve practical problems are typically the source of new technology. And science is tangled up this in some ways, conditioned by technology. Let me talk a little bit more about this in the case of Galileo, and then apply it to our, our theme for today. So it turns out the actual inventor of the telescope was not Galileo. It was Hans Lippershe from Netherlands. And some people say even some others, Zacharias Janssen and Jacob Metius, the inventors. But Lippershey tried to get a patent. Yes, there was a patent system in the Netherlands in the 1600s. And for his telescope, he failed because of a patent dispute. So, uh, somebody keeps doing something with my screen here and I have to keep getting rid of the control. So I can, okay, back. Okay, so Galileo was not the inventor of the telescope. He in fact copied someone else's design through information available through the patent system and he improved upon it. And we can see here that patent dis disputes are not new. They're not a 20th century phenomenon solely. Let's go ahead to Galileo. So he heard about the invention of Lippershe, the so-called perspective glasses. He got hold of that information and he improved the design. He then tried to get a patent himself in, in, in Venice. He did not succeed, but the Senate set him up for life as an academic in uh, the University of Padua. So. Once again, patent disputes, not a modern phenomenon solely. And uh, we have this interesting battle here between Dutch inventors and uh, Galileo. Was this a hackathon, an early model of what we do now in our business schools and engineering schools? Finally, we see that industry university connections are not new. Galileo in some ways pioneered this as a practical craftsman and engineer, technologist and entrepreneur who then became a very prominent figure in European science. Okay, here's an interesting picture of Galilei, Galileo in the, uh, in the 1600s, pitching before a panel of investors. <laughs> this is not new, the uh, business planning pitch. Galileo pioneered that art as well. So I, I, I put this in context that many of the things we talk about here in Europe now of uh, business planning, technology transfer, uh, venture investment in new technology. It's been done before and Galileo was one of our heroes in this area. Okay, moral of the story, innovation and entrepreneurship locally. 
can be stimulated by the international flow of information facilitated by foreign patent systems. And this was in fact the garden in which the flower of modern European science was cultivated. And it's a key source of European economic development. Here's an article that we recently published from here at HHL on this question of what is the process by which new technology emerges? How does innovation actually happen? And we look at the relationship between science and technology and show that in the field of energy technology, anyhow, quite often it's technology that precedes science as was the case with uh, Galileo. Okay, much of this work happened in Italy. So let's talk about Venice where Galileo spent much of his time. Why is Venice so interesting for me? Well, it's beautiful. I once heard a, a, um, a civil engineer said, Venice is the most beautiful city in the world because it has the most beautiful sewerage system. Well, I look at it another way. Venice was the first place in the modern world that had a patent law. In fact, 1474, and here's the actual text of the patent law. So the leaders of Venice, it was a republic, a city republic, by the way, a little bit like Singapore nowadays. Uh, they felt that providing legal protection to the inventors of new technology within the territory of their republic would stimulate uh, innovation and economic development inside the city. So Venice is a real pioneer in this role of uh, patents in economic development and social development. Let's skip ahead a little while. This is not Venice. Do you recognize these people? Strange hairstyles. This is the so-called founding fathers of the United States, about 300 years later after Venice. So one of the things that's interesting for me about the United States is that the founding document of the United States, the original constitution included intellectual property rights as one of the key principles of the, the new country. And here's the actual clause from the, the constitution, it's still there. Congress shall have the power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors, the exclusive right to their respective writings and discovery. So this is uh, a signal, I think of one reason why United States has been so influential in industry and technology in the last 200 years. Intellectual property rights were a founding element of the, the country's uh, constitution. Okay, just for interesting information, this is the very first patent ever issued by the United States three years after the, the new Commonwealth was formed, 1790. A couple of interesting things about this is very short, it's handwritten. This was about a method for producing potash. The, the most interesting thing is the president himself of the United States is the signatory of the patent, George Washington. This signals how important intellectual property was seen by the early founders of the United States. And I think it foreshadows much of what's happened in subsequent times. So let me talk a little bit about intellectual property, what it is. We often think of patents, but there's many other kinds of intellectual property, not just patents. Trademarks, copyright, design rights, trade dress, trade secrets. The key thing about intellectual property is that a government gives the creator or the inventor of the intellectual asset the right to prevent others from using it without permission. This is the essence of intellectual property. And the reason I'm talking about it is that I put it to you that success in technological innovation and in appropriating value from innovation depends heavily on how well intellectual property is managed. We'll get to this in a bit more detail. I'm gonna talk about this for both firms and for countries. So let me give you some practical evidence from my own research. This data is about 10 years old now. It comes from a study I did in the United States of uh, high technology firms in the biomedical technology sector, primarily roughly 200 firms. And I measured the amount of time that people inside firms devote to managing intellectual property and then differentiated between small firms, large firms, startups, and more established firms. Now, the interesting thing you see here is if we look at the totality of work time in companies, uh, roughly 11% on average of total work time in a company is devoted to managing intellectual property. If you focus on the uh, CEO, it's even greater, 14%. But more interesting here is the difference between startups and other types of firms. Startups, the CEO is spending almost 20% 
one fifth of his or her time focusing on intellectual property. In uh, when we look at the whole set of employees in the company, similar rate. So this is extremely important. Think for a moment about how much time in companies we devote to marketing, human resources, finance, accounting. 20%, 14%. How much time do we devote in the curriculum of MBA programs, management programs, intellectual property? A guest lecture here and there. <laughs> you can see where I'm heading with this. Intellectual property and its management is at least as important as uh, other business functions. We perhaps ought to devote some attention to that. This is from the same data set. I looked at the amount of intellectual property assets per person in, in, in firms. And you can see here that small firms proportionally put a lot more effort into obtaining intellectual property assets than large firms on a per capita basis. This is extremely important because there's a, a popular view that intellectual property, especially patents, is too expensive, too difficult, too complicated for startups and small firms to cope with. In fact, little firms, small firms uh, devote resources to obtaining and enforcing intellectual property proportionally much more than large firms. So intellectual property is for startups, entrepreneurial ventures, at least as much as it is for large established firms. His further uh, information I garnered from that same study, I, I measured the financial performance of all the enterprises in my, my study and uh, correlated that with their investment and intellectual property rights. So you can see in this table here uh, that there's a positive relationship, which is statistically significant between investment in patents, trade secrets, and trademarks and financial performance of the firm. Now, most of these firms are small entrepreneurial firms. You can also see uh, from these other columns in the chart here that um, the more research and development intensive a firm is, the greater the impact that is gained from investing in uh, intellectual property assets. Now, all of these firms are high tech, but what this means is the more high tech a firm is, the greater the benefits may be garnered from investing in intellectual property. The last two columns talk about whether or not the firm is engaged in production or manufacturing or not. And you see the same phenomenon, but even more so. Firms which engage in manufacturing or producing products gain financial benefit from investing in intellectual property more than those who do not. So in short, intellectual property is not only something which small firms engage in heavily, they also benefit from it financially. It's expensive to do it right, but the rewards are substantial. Let me switch gears a little bit and uh, share some information from another study that was just published from here at, at HHL. We compared the uh, patenting strategy of Airbus a European firm and Boeing, an American firm. And you can see here that these two firms have used patents as part of their competitive strategy. The, the graphs on the left is uh, patent families, the number of single inventions for which the firms gained international patent uh, protection. The graph on the right is in, individual patents. It's the same data, but expressed a different way. So Boeing is an older firm than Airbus. And you can see here that it was patenting more heavily. And when Airbus began to build up momentum in Europe and become a competitor to Boeing, you can see that Boeing decided to invest heavily in patenting as a competitive weapon against Airbus. And in fact, Boeing sued Airbus quite uh, aggressively around about uh, year 2000. And uh, this caused major problems for Airbus. And you can see they followed by instead patenting quite heavily. And, and in fact, uh, ended up having a much heavier patenting portfolio than, than Boeing. Boeing around about 2004, something like that, leveled out. It's as if they had invested and found, you know, that's enough. We've got enough protection now to, to sue Airbus. But when they realized that Airbus had surpassed them, Boeing then redoubled its effort and then invested more heavily in patenting again. By around the, about 2007, 2008, uh, Airbus reached the point where they said, okay, we've got enough. Now we need to sort of uh, have a stable, uh, supportable long-term strategy. And if you look on the right-hand chart, you can see that in fact, Airbus has been far more international in its patenting strategy than Boeing. 
Eventually, Boeing copied Airbus and is now very international as well. But right now, Boeing has roughly double the amount of patenting costs, expenditure, maintenance activity, and numbers of patents, individual patents, than Airbus. And they have to carry this burden on top of their uh, problems with the safety of their aircraft that we've been hearing so much about. So what, what, what I want you to see here is that these two firms, very large, complex technological enterprises, use patenting as a strategy to uh, deal with competition. And it affects the local economy from which they come. Uh, talking about companies using the patent system as part of their business, this is fresh data from the European Patent Office, just a month or so old. And it shows you the top 10 companies who are applying for patents at the European Patent Office last year. Number one, a Chinese company, Huawei. The next two, Korean companies, Samsung and LG. And it's only the fourth and fifth level, Ericsson and Siemens, where European companies are prominent. Then two American companies, Raytheon and Qualcomm, a Japanese company, and then Philips and, and Bosch again. So in short, you can see that well-known companies that are active in technology do aggressively use the international patent system. And it's uh, not just European companies using European patents. There's an international dimension here. Asian companies from China, Korea, Japan are very active in Europe using the European system to get patent rights here in Europe. Okay. So we've been talking about companies using the patent system to get competitive advantage and to leverage what their event of activity for economic benefit. What about countries? I've done quite a lot of research on this question recently. So let me show you some of the results. Here's a couple of papers that have been recently published. Uh, one together with my student here at HHL, Nadesh de Molina. Most of the data I'm about to show you will come from these two studies. So this is the question I'm looking at. What is the relationship between innovation, starting here in Leipzig, for example, or in your town, and economic development in our community? Is it direct or is it indirect? Is international trade in knowledge intensive goods and services important? And is intellectual property a critical element of that relationship? Well, I guess you can guess what my answer is. This is my, shall we say, hypothesis about how it works. I believe that companies who invent technology need to engage in international business, selling products, services, knowledge internationally in order to appropriate value for the local community. So intellectual property is a channel by which this is done. And gaining international intellectual property rights is a key to success, not just getting patents. Let me show you more about this. This is some data I put together on the relationship between wealth and the gross domestic product per capita, which is the horizontal axis, and patent applications. And you can see here, there's a linear relationship essentially and quite a strong correlation. Essentially, rich countries are very heavy in patenting per person and poorer countries, not so heavy with this spectrum in between here. You can see Germany is right near the top. Interestingly, the very small European countries, Switzerland, Luxembourg, are very prominent, Japan and Korea also. In short, patenting is closely related to wealth. Now, my particular contribution in this discussion is at the international level. Let me elaborate a bit on this. We can differentiate between three different types of patenting. I call them mode one, mode two, mode three. The first one, mode one, is the conventional kind that most people think about. I invent something here in Leipzig or Munich, Frankfurt. I file a patent application at the, the German patent office and I get a German patent as domestic patenting. The second kind is when a foreign company, Huawei, for example, applies to the German patent office for a, a patent. Most of the literature and much of, most of the policy discussions are around these first two kinds of patenting. But my uh, belief strongly is that it's this third kind of patenting, which I call um, outward bound international patenting, which is the most important kind of patenting. Uh, it's my theory, but also there's empirical evidence to support this, which I'll show you in a minute. In short, countries which have uh, inventors and, and companies owning inventions, managing inventions, who patent internationally, 
generate wealth for their community more successfully than those that don't. Let me give you some practical examples of this. Here's some recent data from the World Intellectual Property Organization of patent applications and actually patent grants at the top 10 patent offices. So these countries here are the countries with patent offices that are most popular worldwide. Now, interesting, you can see China is number one uh, country in the world for, for granting patents per year. This is 2019 data. Second is US, Japan, Germany, number nine, although Germany is indirectly included in the EPO as well. So we're seeing two Asian company countries being dominant players in uh, patent grants. The US is now number two in the world. The other thing that's important to notice here is the mix between local and foreign. So United States, for example, you can see the majority of the patent uh, grants are for foreigners, not for American-based applicants. China is the other way around. Most of the patent applicants are, are from China. Germany, it's a kind of even mix. Okay, let me now switch modes a little bit. I, I mentioned that I believe that outward bound international patenting is the most important kind of patenting to facilitate economic development through innovation. So what I've done here is I've split the, the total patenting between two types, mode one and mode three. You have 2000, the year 2000 on the left and the year 2016 on the right. Two observations I make here. Firstly, you can see that the correlation between patenting and, and wealth, meaning gross domestic product per capita, is stronger for international patenting in the green than it is for domestic patenting in the red. Secondly, you can see that this difference has been amplified over the last two decades. In short, the importance of international outward bound patenting for economic development in a country is even more important now than it was uh, some years ago. So interestingly, the literature doesn't talk about that very much, just a little bit. So how important is this, uh, how prominent is this third type of patenting, what I call outward bound international patenting? This is some data I put together with uh, Nadezhda, my student, on this question. And you can see here from the year 2000 until just recently, the number of the proportion of patents worldwide that are outward bound in this mode three category has doubled. Now it's uh, more than half, 56% roughly. So it's extremely important. So even though the literature doesn't talk about it very much, practitioners are becoming much more international in their patenting practice. This means you invent something here in Germany, it's probably more important to get patents in China, Japan, Korea, France, United States, Canada, than it is here in Germany. Oh, of course, Germany matters, but uh, foreign patenting really matters. Okay, I invented an index, iPad, I call it, and I'm waiting for Apple to sue me over this. I'm hoping I'm not in a tra trademark violation category here. It's, it's an index I developed to try and make it easier to compare uh, international patenting behavior of big countries, small countries, and countries of different uh, characteristics. I won't dwell on this, but let's just say it's a measure that allows me to compare the level of outward bound international patenting between countries uh, taking into account differences in their scale. So here's a few countries for which I've calculated this to give you a, a sense of how it works. Now this measure is set up so that if a country scores above 1.0, it means it's competitive, below 1.0, less than competitive. So number one performer, Switzerland, tiny country, extremely good at inventing technology, but not just inventing technology, but obtaining patent rights outside Switzerland and then commercializing uh, the results to the benefit of Switzerland. So number one performer by far. Germany, also very strong. Germany, like Switzerland, invents technology and commercializes that technology internationally through foreign patent systems as a tool. Interestingly, the United States, which we often think of as a leader in innovation, is okay. It's kind of average, slightly above average in international patenting. I guess it's partly because the US market is so large internally. Um, interesting case, the one I find most exciting is Iceland, a tiny little country, started below average in competitiveness in international patenting a couple of decades ago, 
picked up its momentum very quickly. Now it's a very top performer. So this is a phenomenon I've, I've noticed quite a lot in my research. Small countries that are aggressive in inventing and managing intellectual property internationally can rise quickly. India, in some ways, has woken up as well and is uh, even surpassing the United States in its outward bound orientation with patenting. Two of my favorite countries, Russia and China, in the news a lot lately. Uh, China is number one country in the world for patenting, but in fact, rather domestic in its orientation. It has a lot of outward bound international patenting, but it's overshadowed by its domestic uh, patenting, which is why you see this flat line. Russia has been becoming more international in its patenting behavior in recent years, as you can see here, although recent developments suggest that's not going to continue. Okay, you get the point. Uh, by this measure, you can see uh, how strong a country is performing and a small country can leverage this for its benefit, uh, at least as well as a large country. I've taken the same data and divide it up between rich countries, poor countries, and uh, middle-income countries. And this is very interesting. You see, rich countries um, have always been above average in international patenting and are be in becoming even stronger in this capacity. Upper middle-income countries, these are sort of mid-level, comfortable, not poor, not rich, doing okay, are kind of comfortable, not really doing much in this area. The really fascinating thing is this lower middle income countries, poor countries who realize that patenting and international trade seems to matter. So there's this development of, of poorer countries trying to catch up with the richer countries. Now, whether they can translate this into economic benefit is something we need to look at, and I'll, I'll share that with you in a moment. So what I've done now with my student Nadeshta here at HHL is look at trade, shall we say, between country groups in patenting. In other words, when a country, uh, when a company in one country obtains a patent in another country. And what we see here is that most of the growth in outward bound international patenting has been between rich countries and rich countries. Some growth inside uh, upper middle income countries and between upper middle income countries and rich countries. But the poorer countries have reduced the amount of patenting between each other mostly focusing on rich countries. So in short, in recent decades, this phenomenon of outward bound international patenting, which has been the preserve of rich countries mostly, is even more so now concentrated in richer countries. So what we're seeing here is that on one hand, uh, while I argue that outward bound international patenting is a key to economic success through innovation, there seems to be a divergence between countries, rich and poor. So uh, we've looked at this closely and we've divided countries into four groups to try and understand this phenomenon based on two dimensions. One dimension is how fast is their wealth growing per capita uh, product growing? Second is how fast is their outward bound patenting behavior growing? So you can see here, for example, the category I called slow movers, these are countries whose wealth is not increasing very quickly and who are not really aggressively increasing their international patenting behavior. Traders are countries which are increasing their wealth but not very quickly increasing their patenting internationally. Inventors are countries where uh, they're not really increasing their wealth but they're getting aggressive in patenting. And finally, adventurers, these are countries where uh, they're succeeding in simultaneously being aggressive in international patenting and improving their uh, wealth. So you can see roughly 60% of the world's countries, and there's about 143 in this data set, uh, a below average in their outward bound international patenting. Let me just run through these figures a bit more carefully for you to show you how significant this is. Let's look at the first category, which I call, for want of a better term, adventurers. We can see here that this is entirely a phenomenon of rich countries and semi-rich, shall we say, the upper middle income countries. None of the poorer countries are succeeding in this particular category. Slow movers, you see, it's dominated by the poorer countries. Traders, these are countries that are relatively rich, becoming richer, but not very progressive or aggressive in their international patterning. And then finally, this category here, inventors, 
a group of countries that are getting more aggressive. They realize that patenting and managing intellectual property matters, but they're somehow not able to translate this into economic benefit. Okay, this is the same data expressed in a different way. It'll give you a sense of which countries are located in which quadrant. The blue line represents the median score. So you can see on the right-hand side in the middle, there's Germany, Switzerland, France, Ireland, Singapore, Australia, Canada, a few others, Romania, for example. Once again, this is about rate of development. It's not absolute level. So these countries I've just mentioned around about the median on the right-hand side of the chart are countries which are typically wealthy, very solid, high performing in outward bound international patenting, Switzerland, for example, but not increasing the rate of doing so very aggressively. Then you see <clears throat> on the top right hand corner, a number of um, countries that seem to be aggressive in developing their international patenting and improving their economy at the same time. Finland, Denmark, Israel, Austria, Estonia, Japan, interestingly, is in this group as well, Sweden. Macau is a really strange one. I haven't explained that as yet. I'm, I'm going to try and find out what's happening there shortly. Another group at the top there, Grenada, Albania, Montenegro. I can't really explain that. They're increasing their wealth and they seem to be doing a lot of patenting. I can't explain that. But you can see as a general pattern here that the world is being uh, divided increasingly into richer countries who are getting richer and poorer countries who are not getting, uh, <laughs> developing so quickly. And then finally, a smaller group of countries that is aggressive in improving its wealth through innovation and protecting their innovations through intellectual property patents in particular internationally. It seems to me we've got a situation of the world dividing into rich and poor increasingly based on skill in innovation and expressing that innovation through the channel of intellectual property. Some countries realize this and are trying to catch up. Others haven't seemed to have caught on as yet. Okay, so let me just pause for a moment and, and summarize some of our lessons we learned from this. So technological innovation is an international activity. It's almost impossible to succeed in the business of new technology by being only local in a local city, the local town, the local region. Most technology is part of a larger technical system and needs to be commercialized internationally. This means that uh, innovators and the countries they belong to who are successful at engaging internationally are more successful in generating wealth. And this also requires patent protection and other forms of intellectual property management at an international level, not just locally. So exploiting foreign markets and the intellectual property systems of foreign countries is a key factor in national economic development. This means we here in Germany need to understand the United States, Japan, Korea, China, France, <laughs> Switzerland. Okay. And the world is increasingly dividing into rich and poor zones linked with this phenomenon. Okay. With that background, let me just finish in a few more minutes with some comments about intellectual property strategy. So a key theme I want you to take away from this is that uh, intellectual property makes a difference for both companies and countries in their ability to translate innovation into wealth. And it's not just a question of getting patents. As you can see, some of the countries I showed you in a previous chart are getting active in getting patents, but not translating that into wealth. What's required is sophisticated strategy in intellectual property, not just more patents. So what do we mean by this? Let me give you an example of how to think about it for a company that's active in the field of technology. So we can think of many types of intellectual property. I've listed them on the left here. Trade secrets, design rights, utility patents, trademarks, for example. And then on the right-hand side, countries. Each column represents a separate country. So a question that an entrepreneur needs to ask that a technology intensive company needs to engage in is in which countries do we need to obtain intellectual property rights and enforce them? Not just shall we get a patent or not here in our home country, Germany, but whereabouts in the world do we need to position ourselves with the different types of intellectual property rights? So it's a basic strategy question. 
And let me put it to you like this. Perhaps some entrepreneurs don't think about intellectual property. It's too difficult, too expensive, too complicated. But after listening to this talk, they say, ah, Willoughby has said patents matter, intellectual property matter. Okay, I'll get a patent for my invention. Maybe I'll uh, register my copyright. I'll register the design of my product and maybe file for a trademark as well. Great. I'm now an intellectual property intensive firm. I call this the passive weak approach because it's focused on the home jurisdiction, the home country. As you know, from what I've said earlier today, I think it's the international that really matters. Okay, but somebody's read my stuff. Somebody's thought about this. They've had some bad experiences, a bit like Airbus being sued by Boeing. And they wake up, oh dear, we've got to do better than this. The world matters. We have to get intellectual property rights worldwide. I heard Willoughby's talk. So let's do it. So you actually saw in Airbus, they started with this kind of weak, naive strategy, as I called it. And once they got sued by Boeing, they started becoming very aggressive internationally. Looks something like this. Okay, what's wrong with this? Can you guess? It seems wise. Protect yourself internationally, just like I say. Okay, I see a comment from Professor Christoph Ann here. How, it's expensive, especially for small firms. Okay, getting global intellectual property protection costs a lot, takes a lot of effort, a lot of time, it's difficult. Who can afford this? Maybe there's only a handful of countries in the world who have enough money, enough capacity to do this. So I think this is actually not a very wise approach unless you're Apple or something like this. So I, I, what I propose here is what we mean by strategy is that companies need to get what I call a sophisticated or artful approach to intellectual property protection internationally. Choose which jurisdictions or companies countries are actually necessary or helpful and which types of intellectual property are prudent and useful. This is an art. There's some sophistication required, but companies that do this, I think, perform better. I'd argue that Airbus has managed to do something like this at a large scale. For little companies, little countries, I mean, sorry, entrepreneurial ventures, this is even more crucial because the time, the money is a constraint. One of the key things about entrepreneurial ventures is that they simply don't have enough money and other resources to pursue all the goals they have. So being artful and sophisticated in IP management is critically important. I think we could argue that it's even more important for smaller firms than for bigger firms. And finally, another dimension of strategy is not only in which countries to get intellectual property protection and to enforce it, but uh, which parts of the company ought to be engaged in this process. I guess an older conservative approach is send it over to the legal department to file for a patent application. But really, Intellectual property has to be integrated into strategy of the enterprise. And this re requires involving various parts of the company in the planning and decision-making, product development, marketing, finance, human resources. For example, you know, what kind of people do we need to hire into our company? What kind of training programs so that our enterprise can be, uh, shall we say, sophisticated in its management of intellectual property? So this is a strategy question that needs to be faced not only by managers of large corporations, but by entrepreneurs. Okay, we're at the end. So what's the conclusion? To gain benefit from technological innovation locally, both individual people, organizations, and communities need to develop prowess, skill in the management of intellectual property. It's not enough just to invent things and try to set up a business to commercialize it. The intellectual property dimension is essential in, shall we say, the majority of cases. Second conclusion, skill in managing intellectual property is a core, what I call dynamic capability of companies engaged in, in technological innovation. In the same way that marketing, research and development, finance, government relations, public relations, operations, supply chain, all of these functions which we think are so important in business need to be matched by another function which I call the management of intellectual property. It's especially true for entrepreneurial ventures whose business is related to technological innovation. I'll stop there 
and happy to take any questions and hear your opinions. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much, uh, Calvin, for all the insights. There's actually, there, there was a question throughout um, that I wanted to read to you that um, somebody was saying it's all true, but a patent system that primarily serves big applications is doomed. It's also, it also has to serve the SMEs. So the big question is, how do we keep SMEs on board um, throughout that uh, process? Wonderful question. Well, um, I know it's widely believed that the patent system is doomed. And there's also many people who believe that it should be weakened, shut down, ended with a view that patents and other types of intellectual property impede innovation. It's a very popular view. But in fact, it's growing more popular, even if it's supposedly to be doomed, it is more popular. But the question still remains, how can little enterprises afford uh, to deal with it? The answer is uh, a certain level of skill prowess is needed by entrepreneurs and managers of small enterprises, much more in some ways than is the case with the big companies. Big companies don't need intellectual property in the same way that small companies do. Uh, big companies uh, will use it. They'll use whatever means they have, but larger companies have many other resources. They can use market power, and other, other means to maintain their position. Small companies, startups don't have that kind of power. So intellectual property is one of the few areas of leverage they have to compete against larger enterprises, but it is expensive. And so of course, uh, patent offices need to think about this, governments need to think about this, but you know, the biggest expense is not in the cost of filing patents, it's in the time and expertise required to craft patents directly and to choose which kind of intellectual property uh, protection is appropriate for the enterprise. So in short, the only way to cope with this is through sophisticated strategy by uh, managers of, of smaller enterprises. And the other point is if you think about intellectual property, not just as patents, but this whole mixture of things, trade secrets, trademarks, design rights, and at an international level, then skillfulness agility in moving across these different types of intellectual property is a kind of protection against the, the, the bigger enterprises. Sure, the big companies have the assets, the expertise to win and often will win simply because of brute power and force. But we can't let that happen as, as a routine practice. Little firms can protect themselves if they're skillful. You can't just uh, get a patent and hope to win. You have to be sophisticated with it. Now it's expensive, but I think this needs to be budgeted into the uh, work of the enterprise. You know, if you get it right, you can pay for the costs. <laughs> if you don't get it right, you haven't got the money anyway. <laughs> Um, thank you very much. There's actually a couple more questions. I'm just going to go on with the with the next one. What do you think are the most common mistakes companies do when they apply for a patent? I think uh, one mistake is not to carefully check who else has already invented something in this area before. You know, <laughs> checking prior art. For example, uh, Mr. Lippershey in Netherlands didn't check his prior art correctly when he applied for a patent in the, the Netherlands. And it, this is a very common problem. Patents get rejected because uh, the claimed invention is not really new or it's obvious. Um, the second thing is not carefully crafting the wording of the application to define uh, correctly where is the true uh, inventive contribution. It's not just a question, I invented something, file a patent application, hope you get a patent the skill to, to crafting and expressing what it is you've in, invented. The third thing is you ne need to relate your patent strategy or other IP strategy to the actual elements of your invention and your product strategy. So, you know, uh, there's many things that can be patented and you can only afford to do one or two, perhaps, choosing very wisely which aspect of your, your inventive activities that need protection and which ones are not is important. And, and bear in mind, you can mix and match publishing, for example, to prevent others from patenting as a way of protecting your space to operate. Alternatively, um, keeping some of your inventions secret, others protected by copyright, for example, mm -hmm. on code for software and other parts through patenting. So in, in short, you need to be nimble and agile if you're an entrepreneur in mixing and matching these different kinds of elements to have any chance of um, 
uh, of benefiting. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, so imagine um, I've got a startup now. In which stage of the life of my startup should the entrepreneur start considering the IP strategy, given the uncertainty and, and obviously the shortage of funds? The answer is right at the very beginning when you're thinking about everything else. <laughs> Because if you, let's say you borrow your grandmother's life savings, <laughs> go into debt on your credit cards, sell your house, <laughs> borrow the, the, the spouse as a, jewelry, whatever it is, and then take, take in a, a, an investment from an angel investor and get moving, get your friends to work for nothing for a year, and then discover your product has already been uh, patented by someone else, you, you lose everything. So the point is you need to do it right at the beginning. I can give you an example. One of my students in, in my previous university got a grant to go and spend a year in California working on a new uh, biomedical technology uh, problem. And she had to do a project with me analyzing the intellectual property landscape of her area. And she found out everything she was being funded to do had already been done before. So she had to completely change her project. Better to do this at the beginning rather than later on. And she was hoping to create a startup through her, uh, through her research. So in short, at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're wasting your time, probably. Yeah, and my, uh, my grandma's money. <laughs> yeah. um, um, so what is the connection between technologists, for example, the story of Galileo uh, that you brought in the beginning of the talk, and the management of IP, apart from the obvious need to patent inventions? Well, I guess, stereotypically, most scientists and engineers don't care about intellectual property. They say, leave that to the lawyers or the business people. I'm an engineer, let me do my job. But the problem is that um, uh, what you do in research and product design and development is influenced by the rights of others. You can be blocked from commercializing your invention or getting value from your invention if it's uh, already, uh, if it's infringing someone else's rights, for example. So in, in short, engineers and scientists of course, don't need to stop being an engineer and scientist to become lawyers, but need to know enough about intellectual property and how to use the tools of uh, IP information to plan their strategy for design, for research accordingly, particularly when uh, engineers, for example, from a university or a company are planning to set up a new venture, maybe you know, spin out from a university or get involved in a spin out project from a larger company, Uh, thinking about the intellectual property dimensions early on during the design process is, is really essential. Mm, makes sense. I actually would just have a question. Throughout your um, presentation, you gave an overview of that there's many intellectual property rights and you kept on saying trade dress. Uh, and I wasn't really sure what that actually is or what that means. Uh, maybe you just can fill me in on that. Okay. Have you ever been to an Apple store? We don't have yeah. one here in Leipzig, but when you're in an Apple store, you know exactly where you are. So Apple has got a, an aesthetic, a style, which is characteristic of the Apple store. And it's mm -hmm. part of their business strategy. It's called trade dress. It's actually a branch of trademark. So Apple has got trademark rights on the look and feel of the Apple store. So it's, it's illegal to have a store that looks and feels like the Apple store in the category of products. That's trade dress. It's a very sophisticated part of uh, commercialization of, of products. Apple is the pioneer in this, but many others. McDonald's is good at it as well. Many companies are using this strategy now. Trade dress, the first time I'm hearing this, very, very intriguing. Um, there's a couple of people saying that, um, obviously it was a great presentation, just throwing it out there. Is there any more questions from the audience as of right now? Obviously, if there's any questions, um, Coming up, coming up afterwards, you can always uh, reach out to Calvin. We're also taping this um, this talk tonight, so if you want to revisit it later on, and you know questions come up, uh, please don't hesitate to let us know. Um, um, he's saying somebody's saying right, uh, especially as it relates to SMEs. Um, so I think uh, if I'm seeing this, enforcement and its cost is a key question. Mm -hmm. um, um, is there anything you want to fill in on that? Uh, I was just seeing that here coming up. This is a really important observation. So you know, the cost of getting a patent and maintaining it in say several countries over a 10 year period, you may be looking at 100,000 euro or something like that, expensive. But the real cost is if you get sued or you need to sue somebody for infringing your rights and you may be hitting a million or two. 
when you do that. So how are you gonna afford this? And I think there's a couple of comments about this. When you do financial planning for a technology venture, you need to take into account that you may need a million or two in your bank account to defend your rights if somebody's infringing uh, your rights, for example, or if you get sued. It's just part of business if you're trying to develop and grow as, as a venture. If you don't do it, you die. So it's simple, <laughs> but if you don't do it, you know, what's your choice? The other thing is there is increasing number of, um, in, for example, insurance policies. There are companies now that issue insurance policies for patent infringement. So, you know, adding an extra 50,000 a year to your insurance bill to cover patent infringement may be a good investment. And you, you need to have investors who understand how important this is, who put that as part of their, their financing strategy for the enterprise. Interesting. Would you have any recommendation for REITs on strategic IP management? Anything that you uh, can share right now? Or any anybody in particular that you have in mind? I, I will put together a list of some um, books and articles on this topic that are easy to follow, and I'll I'll post them on our website or make them available by email to all the people who who, who registered. How perfect. about that? Uh, sounds perfect. I was just uh, reading it from uh, from any of the comments. Um, so um, there's one more question coming up just now. Oops, uh, let me just look. This was really quickly. Many financial institutions still don't recognize uh, IP as a strategic asset. Any thoughts on this? Yes. Um, accounting conventions are part of the problem. You know, accountants are trained in certain rules and regulations about what's a, an admissible asset to list on your balance sheet, for example. And the accounting profession is very conservative about this. So in, in my research, I found that typically the intangible assets represented by intellectual property in technology firms are typically worth four or five times more than the tangible assets or the permissible assets that accountants are allowed to list in, on the balance sheet. So the point is, uh, following normal accounting standards discounts the majority of the value of, of entrepreneurial technology firms, not just a little bit. So this means um, financial institutions who go by the balance sheet are missing out. They're, they're kind of irrelevant in some ways to entrepreneurial finance. This is why we have specialized financial channels for uh, entrepreneurial companies using bootstrapping, angel investors, venture capitalists, various kinds of partnerships. In short, I think an entrepreneurial uh, technology uh, venture needs to look to unorthodox financing sources in order to survive, partly for this reason, because the accounting profession is really not permitted to acknowledge the reality of most of the intellectual value of an enterprise. Very interesting. So keeping in mind the timings and um, already having picked your brain for a very, very long time, um, I wanted to say thank you at this point, a huge, huge thank you and a virtual round of applause um, for all the insights you've provided us with tonight. It was an absolute pleasure, uh, very interesting. Um, and it's also uh, absolutely wonderful to have you as part of our HHL um, academic um, professors, lecturers here at HHL now. So. Um, we hope to have you very soon again, uh, maybe in a different format, maybe again as part of a expo talk, hopefully at some point also in person, which would be absolutely delightful. I also want to say thank you to the audience for joining us uh, today and for bringing up a lot of really great questions. It's always great to have you. And lastly, obviously a huge thank you to Carmen in the background, our director for event management, who's always um, the angel in the background who sets up everything. So um, everybody, thank you for tonight. Um, it's been a pleasure. I hope you've learned something. Again, the talk is going to be online on YouTube. You can always revisit it. And if there's any questions, um, I'm very much sure Carmen is more than happy to answer anything in the, in the aftermath. And af otherwise, enjoy the rest of your evening. And yeah, stay healthy and safe. And see you all very, very soon. Bye, everybody. Thank you.